Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Naomi Rao, who is, uh, it's a funny thing for someone whose job it is to uh, pull back the administrative state to introduce her by her formal title, which is administrator. She is the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at the Office of Management and Budget. And she's probably the most important government official no one has ever heard of. Because her job and her office is to review every major regulation issued by the federal government for its costs and benefits. And to suspend, block, or send back regulations where the uh, costs exceed the benefits. So if you imagine, she really is the, uh, operates the chokehold on the ongoing activities of the administrative state. Uh, I've known her for so long, I'm able to introduce her without any notes and purely from memory, uh, which is uh, going to be a scary thing for her when we get to the question and answer period. But Naomi is a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, which is where I uh, first met her. And then she clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, after that, she uh, became somehow a professor of law at George Mason University Law School. And then she founded a center for the study of the administrative state and regulations. So it couldn't be a more perfect person for the administration to bring in to actually run the office that supervises all the regulatory lawmaking in uh, the government. And so uh, as, you can, as you may remember before uh, we begin, uh, this administration has been taking a lot of credit for deregulation. And I think uh, Naomi may well be personally responsible for about a quarter of all the economic growth last year. Because if you listen to what the administration itself says, and our former colleague Kevin Hassett, uh, who's now the head of the CEA, they attribute a lot of the economic growth last year to deregulation before the tax cuts went to effect. If there's anybody who's responsible, it would be Naomi in her office. So uh, she will give about 15 minutes of remarks, and then I'll ask her a few questions, and we'll open it up uh, to all of you. But please join me in uh, welcoming Naomi back to AEI. Well, thanks, John, for that very kind uh, introduction. It's, uh, it's great to be here at AEI and with all of you. And uh, with John, who I have, I was talking to someone, I said, I don't even remember how I first met John. I've known him so long, so I, I guess I'm getting old. Um, so, you know, John said what many people say when they introduce me. It's, you know, that I'm the head of the most important office you've never heard of. And I'll be honest, like, I, I can't, I used to consider this to be a compliment, but now I'm not sure entirely because I can't decide if they're focusing on the most important part or the you've never heard of it part. And, well, anyway, here I am. So um, I think it's also interesting that um, the title for today's remarks is on assessing the administrative state. Because, frankly, that term, the administrative state, wasn't really used very often until maybe, maybe a few years ago. But I think it's an important term because it signifies an understanding that the administrative state really is its own sort of entity. And so we should be thinking about it as such and evaluating it as its own kind of entity. You know, recently there was an article in the Harvard Law Review that talked about a movement of anti-administrativists. Um, you know, maybe I was even one of them. But, um, but I think that there has been this process of raising some very fundamental questions about the administrative state. And, and that term itself has become much more mainstream. Um, just last week, I was speaking to the Second Circuit at their annual judicial conference. And the whole conference over several days was about the administrative state. And they called it that, the administrative state. So, um, so I, think there's, I think even using that terminology has indicated a real shift. And, and today, I think we see that regulatory reform has a lot of proponents, um, of course, in the Trump administration, but also in Congress and, and the courts. So, so today, I just wanted to discuss a little bit about what we've been up to in the administration with respect to deregulation and, um, and talk about the role that my office has played in that. <clears throat> so, so as John mentioned, my office undertakes um, a process of centralized regulatory review. I think that that regulatory review at OIRA is a, an essential component of ensuring presidential direction of regulatory policy. So regulatory review within the executive office of the president furthers an important principle, which is unitary direction 
of the executive branch. And um, in addition, I think my office serves across administrations to promote faithful execution of the laws through good regulatory practices. So we have, I think in this administration, been, been very committed to, to deregulation. The president made regulatory reform one of his topmost priorities. He's issued a flurry of executive orders early last year um, to revisit and revise specific regulatory areas, um, including in energy and the environment, in health and labor and tax. And, and I think he made another very important move, which was he issued an executive order that directed kind of government-wide significant structural reform. And he did that by requiring agencies to eliminate two regulations for each new one, and also by setting a zero regulatory budget for the first fiscal year he was in office, right? Which means that the agencies across the government should not impose any new regulatory costs. And, um, and at the end of the last fiscal year, we had achieved a lot of success. We were actually at 22 deregulatory actions for each new significant regulation. And those actions saved over $8 billion in regulatory costs. Um, I think even, you know, what those numbers, you know, maybe just to be, to be clear, what we've essentially done is we've dramatically slowed the imposition of costly new regulations and guidance documents, and we've really shifted away from the inertia that has favored the steady expansion of the administrative state. I think there's been a tremendous amount of progress in a very short period of time. And in this fiscal year, agencies project, project even more deregulatory actions. Um, you know, a lot of the big deregulatory efforts are going to take a lot of time. You know, we have to go through the whole notice and comment rulemaking process. Um, and so some of those much more substantial deregulatory actions will, um, will take effect either this year or next year. And, and it's our belief that these reform efforts have spurred job creation and economic growth, and they've also helped promote technological innovation. Um, and what we're really focused on is trying to create more confidence in the public, right? That the government is not going to be arbitrarily imposing new burdens. And we hope that our efforts have returned at least to the American people a little more liberty to pursue their goals unfettered by these sorts of regulatory burdens. So, um, so how have we done this? I mean, you know, OIRA really is, I mean, you we're a small office. We're only about 50 employees, and we oversee, as John mentioned, the significant regulatory activity of, of the entire federal government. And so, um, so we're kind of, we're well positioned, I think despite our size, to help coordinate and drive some of these deregulatory efforts. Um, you know, and our office was created essentially to oversee and provide checks on a rapidly expanding administrative state. Um, OIRA was created by President Reagan, which, you know, who arguably was the last president to take deregulation so seriously. So, so the process that we operate on is created by a series of executive orders, um, which provide certain principles for how we conduct our review, but also a, a mechanism for how we do centralized regulatory review. And to me, I think, you know, when I think about my office, I think that one of the most important functions we provide is helping to promote a more unitary executive. Now, um, you know, what's that? I mean, you know, the unitary executive, of course, is an understanding that Article 2 of the Constitution vests all executive power in a single president. And so accordingly, the entire executive branch should be supervised by the president. And the president has the responsibility for directing the actions of administrative agencies and for being accountable for the actions that they take. So the unitary executive is a very important principle within our constitutional structure. It protects separation of powers and ultimately individual liberty. So, so how, does, how does this office uh, relate to the unitary executive? Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about our process and so you can see how it kind of fits together. So if you think about it, I mean, if the president is supposed to oversee and direct the executive branch, you think about the the literally millions of federal government employees that work in administrative agencies, right? We have so many agencies. I think each day in my job, I learn about the existence of a new agency or sub-agency that I haven't previously encountered. So, so how would the president, how would the White House get a handle on the regulatory activity of all of these different agencies? 
So, so I think OIRA is one of the, the few formalized mechanisms for doing this. And, and the way it sort of works is, you know, agencies come to us and they say, here, you know, here are the regulatory actions we're thinking about undertaking in the coming months. And we work with the agencies to decide which of those regulatory actions are significant or economically significant. And, and ultimately, it's my office that decides, and we can decide what regulations we pull in to review. And, um, and so that's a very, um, I think that's, of, you know, a very important idea, right? So we are essentially helping the White House identify what's important enough for the White House to review. And, um, and so once a rule comes into OIRA, we share it with other parts of the Executive Office of the President. It goes to the National Economic Council, the Domestic Policy Council, White House Counsel's Office, and it also goes to other agencies that may have equities in the rule. So, so the process is really an important step for, for presidential direction and control. And, and a OIRA review is really, it's not just sort of the green eye shade and costs and benefits, but, but the OIRA review process is really about White House review and, and interagency review. You know, it gives the president's senior advisors an opportunity to weigh in and to make sure that the agencies are, are exercising their discretion in a way that's consistent with the president's overall priorities. So I think centralized review can create greater accountability for regulatory actions, and it can promote this kind of essential constitutional check. It also allows for more consistent regulatory policy. You know, we frequently have a case where one agency is you know, interested in taking a regulatory action that may be inconsistent with something happening in another agency. And so, um, the OIRA process, you know, provides a vehicle for, for resolving some of those conflicts and also, you know, checking a general problem in agencies, which is, you know, agencies are, are single-minded, right? They have a mission and they're trying to pursue that mission, you know, sort of in a single-minded way. And so the OIRA process kind of opens up regulations to a broader view, right, to other, um, to other senior advisors and other agencies which hopefully um, helps to counteract some of the agency myopia and, and tunnel vision. So, you know, agencies don't always love OIRA review, as you might imagine, but, but I think it's very important for accountability. You know, we have political officials, of course, at agencies who, who are primarily responsible for setting regulatory policy, but ultimately they all report up uh, through the chief executive, um, you know, the president. So I'll just say a little bit too, you know, OIRA review also promotes a number of institutional best practices. You know, policy preferences, of course, change. You know, the regulatory policy of the Obama administration is not the regulatory policy we have today. But, um, but the functions that happen in, these office, in my office, I think, you know, in almost every administration provides some important checks. So one of the things we, we really look for is to ensure that when an agency is acting, it's acting consistent with law. Now, that seems fairly obvious, but it perhaps not always emphasized. Um, you know, we want to make sure agencies have authority for their actions. And in this administration, we encourage agencies to take the best reading of a statute, right? We don't want them to adopt expansive readings just because they will receive deference in a judicial challenge. And so we're trying to respect the lawmaking power of Congress by staying within the authority that's been given to agencies by Congress. Um, and regulations, of course, have to meet standards of cost-benefit analysis. And you know, I like to say the benefits need to substantially justify the costs. Otherwise, why is the government acting at all? And, um, and we require from agencies you know, careful analysis. So, so obviously you can imagine you know, all the benefits of this in an administration that's focused on deregulation, um, but it also serves a very important role even um, you know, in a more regulatory environment such as the last administration where OIRA provides, I think, an important limit on how far agencies can go. So, so of course we have, you know, in this administration, been very focused on regulatory reform. And, and we've kind of gone about it in a few ways. I mean, first of all, there's sort of the practical work of deregulating, and that's sort of the daily, the daily work that my staff is, is engaged with. Um, and you know, we can talk about that more in the questions if you're interested in that. But we've also worked with agencies to promote uh, a consistent and principled message of reform. You know, this isn't just about you know, saving 
uh, regulatory costs, although of course that's part of it. But, but to me, you know, a lot of this comes down to individual liberty, right? We, we believe in regulatory reform because it gives people more freedom to work hard, to exercise their ingenuity, which of course in turn, um, you know, we believe results in economic growth and technological development. Um, and we're focused on the rule of law, right? We are emphasizing due process, you know, making sure agencies, you know, give people due process and that they promote fair notice, that at least they are giving notice to people of the actions that they are taking. Um, you know, we've really tried to, to shift the culture around guidance documents, which are kind of, they're not quite regulations. You know, they're, they're often agency just statements of policy. You know, we don't want agencies setting um, new requirements through those kinds of guidance documents. And um, in addition to those things, you know, we're also um, focused on certain governmental structural reforms and, you know, pushing this idea of centralized review into different spheres. So, for instance, just a few months ago, my office signed an agreement with the Department of Treasury to review tax regulations. Um, you know, based on a longstanding agreement for the 80s, my office didn't review tax regulations um, for a number of reasons I won't necessarily go into here. But, but if you think about tax regulations, they're the one type of regulation that affects every American, right? Every man, woman, and child is subject, essentially, to, to tax regulations. Um, and so very important, then, you would think, to make sure that the types of burdens tax regulations are imposing are, are at least given a second look and are checked. Um, and so we're going, to be, we're going to be working with the Department on Treasury on implementing a more robust review of tax regulatory burdens. But, you know, and I think maybe that all sounds like inside baseball. But, but I do think it establishes an important principle, which is that there are no pockets of the executive branch that should be um, independent of centralized regulatory review. And I think that this, um, this agreement with Treasury suggests that maybe these broader principles could also be extended to what we call, you know, in DC, the independent agencies, although query where independent agencies exist in our constitutional structure. So maybe that's something we can also talk about if you're interested in that. But um, so I'll just wrap up by saying I think OIRA really works hard to promote a more constitutional and coherent regulatory policy. And, and the commitment to regulatory reform requires a, a lot of hard work and pressure, not just from my office, but from reform-minded political appointees across the executive branch. And, um, and I guess I'll say, I mean, of course, in my current position, I'm focused on what we can do um, within the executive branch to help with regulatory reform and, and curbing the administrative state. But I think this is, not, um, this is not a program just for the executive branch. I believe that, you know, to have real, um, you know, kind of a more complete regulatory reform, it, it needs to involve all three branches of the government. Um, you know, and Congress and the courts have a very important role to play there as well. So, well, with that, maybe I'll stop and um, meet up with John for the questions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, Naomi, that was great, and uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, as you may know, we have a large number of uh, college and law students in the audience. You thought you would get away from them by joining the government, but you couldn't. I love students. <laughs> that makes one of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. So uh, I thought uh, it might be uh, just for fun for them to learn, how did you get from the University of Chicago, where I met you as a young, innocent third-year law student, uh -huh. all the way to running the administrative state and stop it from growing? How did I get here? Yeah, how did you get here? How, oh, why did you get here? How did you pick you know, this area as the thing you wanted to do? Um, you know, so many jobs in, I don't know, you kind of can put yourself in the right position for things. And then, I don't know, I found that my career has been sometimes a series of happy accidents, maybe. And, um, you know, I've always been very, you know, as a law professor, I was very interested in structural constitutional law and thinking about how all the parts of the government fit together. And then I started the Center for the Study of the Administrative State because I really think the administrative state is where some of the most important and thorniest um, administrative law questions come up, right? It's the, 
The administrative state, I think, is what challenges, raises the greatest challenge to our constitutional system of government. And, um, and then my friend Adam White, who may be familiar to some of you, he's at Hoover. He, he wrote a blog post, I think, in the Weekly Standard saying, here are some people who could be the administrator of OIRA. Some of them are even my friends. Um, and he listed me as one of them, and I thought, huh, maybe I could be the administrator of OIRA. Mm -hmm. And so here I am. So. <laughs> wow. Huh? It was that easy. Well, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, so it's, um, who knows how things work in strange ways. Okay, now for the geeky administrative law questions. Yeah. So uh, listening to your uh, talk, you might say uh, formally the procedure that you follow is not that different than formally the procedures the Obama administration claimed they were following. And yet, if you just look at the number of pages in the Federal Register, which is the document that issues all the regulations, we have gone from the administration which set the records for the most regulations ever issued, I think to the administration that has now set the record for the least number of regulations issued in a year, first year of the presidency. So if you look behind the formal rules, what are you doing differently from the Obama administration that has produced this enormous change? Sure. So, um, so of course, you know, we contribute to deregulation and work with agencies on that, but we're not the only entities responsible. So um, I think a big difference, of course, in this administration is that really from the top, the president has said this is an important priority, which um, at least gives, you know, so we have a lot of um, agency heads, you know, cabinet secretaries who are kind of gleefully deregulating and they're doing a great job, but for the ones who are more reluctant, I think because it's a presidential priority, that gives me leverage to kind of push deregulatory ideas on agencies. And, um, you know, ultimately, I do think in the last administration, OIRA probably made many of the rules better. Maybe hard to see that um, always, you know, given the enormous regulatory output. But I think the rules would have been even worse, perhaps, if OIRA hadn't been involved. And so, uh, you know, my office can't stop an administration that is hell-bent on regulating. But I do think, you know, in a deregulatory environment, we can kind of, you know, we have a lot of backing, I guess. You know, I have a lot of support both in the White House and um, in the agencies to, to accomplish this mission. So. so in the past, there was a senator who uh, retired long ago, who used to give out this award every year called the Golden Fleece Award. I don't think it's still given, but every year he would find the worst example of federal spending and give it a prize. So he's the one who I think found that you know, the Air Force got billed for a $700 hammer, he gave the Golden Fleece Award. So I don't know if you've got such a prize that you're thinking of, but if you could give out a prize to the absolute worst regulation that you stopped in your first year, hmm. what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, there was one um, one regulation that I think had sort of started in the previous administration, which I thought was, it was regulating a fish in a river. And it had designated as critical habitat almost a 1,000 miles of river, even though this particular fish could only access a few hundred miles of the river. And I said, well, why are we designating these additional? They're like, well, you know, eventually this fish will be able to get to that part of the river. But they said there were actually two dams separating the fish from you know, some seven or 800 miles of river. And I know this, this sounds like a small thing, but why? You know, why are we regulating all the businesses, farms, and homeowners along a seven or 800 mile stretch of river if the fish will never live there? And of course, so they went back and they, they fixed it and they limited the critical habitat to those few hundred miles. But I think there are, I think that's just indicative of a lot of regulation that comes through, which is, you know, someone thinks, well, this is a good idea. Let's just extend it as far as we think it might reasonably ever go. And, you know, they're not really paying attention to the consequences. And someone said, well, what's a few, you know, 700 miles of river? It's like, well, 700 miles of river is, you think about like the East Coast. I mean, it's an enormous stretch of land. And, you know, there'd be hundreds, thousands of people impacted by, by that designation. So, you know, I think that's just one sort of example when you just kind of take a critical look, almost from a common sense perspective. Why is the government doing this? Um, you know, and often the answer is, well, it really shouldn't be doing this. And, you know, frankly, you know, the principles for OIRA really have been constant over time, like President Clinton's executive order, which is the one we still operate on, um, says, you know, the first question is, you know, do we need to regulate at all? 
you know, like you first need to think about, is there a reason for the regulation? Has there been a substantial market failure? Um, so we're not in the business of like finding, um, you know, we're not in the business of just regulating for the sake of it or just to have the government create benefits. We really want it to be focused on something where we believe the government can actually make a difference as opposed to leaving people free to do their own thing. So uh, President Obama's first head of OIRA was a fellow named Cass Sunstein who was a professor of yours, I think, a friend of mine, a former colleague of mine. And he, uh, even though he was part of an administration that heavily regulated, in President Obama's first term, he wrote, since he left, that the area that I think he saw the most regulation, where he had to, I think, keep the closest eye on what the government was doing was environmental law. Your, your fish story is a good example. Um, is that still true? Is it really uh, in the, the effort to manage the environment and stop climate change? Is that really where, is that still the area where you see the most overregulation? Uh, in the press, you see a lot of discussion of financial overregulation from the last administration. Is that now become an area where, so what are the areas where you're spending most of your time keeping an eye on the agencies and which areas are doing a pretty good job on their own? Yeah, so I do think the environmental area is one in which, in the past, um, has imposed the greatest costs, right? It's sort of some of the most sweeping regulation that we have. And, and I guess in this administration, deregulating in the environmental space takes up a great deal of our time. You know, working with the EPA on revising the Clean Power Plan, the Waters of the United States Rule, um, the Fuel Economy Standards, right? All of these are deregulatory actions that are underway um, at the EPA, the Department of Transportation. So that takes up, it does take up a tremendous amount of time. And it's surprising how active, well, maybe it's not surprising, but the government has been extremely active in that area. Um, I do think that we are conscious of the fact that there's a lot of overreach in financial regulations, but um, we do not review the rules of independent agencies. And most of financial regulation comes out of independent agencies, like the Securities and Exchange Commission, the CFTC, um, you know, the FTC, right? So we, um, so we don't review those rules currently. So uh, that, that last point you made brings me to the question that mm -hmm. you actually posed yourself, which was on my list too, which is uh, uh, if you think about uh, deregulation, it might come in ebbs and flows based on elections but there are possibly more structural permanent things which would be immune to, or at least harder to change just based on partisan elections. You mentioned one of them might be the place of independent agencies. So how would that happen? How could we, or how could you or your office try to start bringing more of the actions of the independent agencies to uh, cost benefit analysis? Sure. So. Um so currently, my office does have a number of legal authorities over independent agencies. And I think we can use those, I think, more robustly. So under the Congressional Review Act, um, we decide whether an independent agency's rule is major and therefore would have a delayed effective date in Congress, right? And so um, we could ask for more analysis on Congressional Review Act decisions. We review all the forms and paperwork burdens of the independent agencies. Um, and I think that's another thing that we could be doing a little bit more robustly. You know, to take independent agencies into the real, like the full process of centralized review, I think that could be done through an executive order by the president. It's something that has been thought about since President Reagan created OIRA in the early 80s. And in fact, Cass Sunstein, who you mentioned already, you know, I think he wrote the Office of Legal Counsel opinion in the early 80s saying that it would be constitutional to have such an executive order. Um, you know, I think it would lead to better regulatory practices. I mean, right now, there are lots of inconsistent and overlapping and duplicative regulations between, I think, especially many of the financial regulatory agencies. I think the OIRA process could help with that. You know, we could help make sure that there's more robust cost-benefit analysis. You know, the SEC has lost a number of cases in the D.C. Circuit based on inadequate analysis. So... Um, you know, and this position, I think sometimes people think of it as a kind of a crazy right-wing idea, but it's pretty mainstream. You know, the American Bar Association thinks OIRA should review the rules of independent agencies. So does the Administrative Conference of the United States. Um, and I think ultimately it would be, well, I mean, 
you know, I've written in my, in my scholarly work, I don't really believe in independent agencies. So I think it would help make the government uh, more constitutional and we would have probably better regulatory policy if OIRA reviewed the rules of independent agencies. So just in the interest of putting you on the spot, yeah. is the administration currently thinking of an executive order that would place independent agencies under uh, the, so, as you described, this more centralized so, regulatory yeah, I mean, I've said publicly, publicly before that this is something we are actively considering. So we'll see. Really? I can't wait to see you try to fire the head of the CFPB, yeah. who happens to be your boss. He happens to be my <laughs> the head boss. Head of OMB That's at right. the same time. Well, I couldn't fire him, but the president, we <laughs> could fire him. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, you mentioned a few other things in your talk, which would, uh, you know, just uh, briefly, that also might people have talked about as more permanent structural. You mentioned the Chevron uh, doctrine, or you alluded to the Chevron doctrine. How could, uh, First of all, how could that change? So for those of you who don't know, the Chevron Doctrine means that uh, federal courts, when they review agency interpretations of regulations, defer to any n not unreasonable <laughs> regulation interpretation of the agency, which gives agencies quite a sweep to interpret their powers. A related doctrine also means they defer quite heavily to agencies' actual choices then on how to use that power. Um, I think in your scholarly work, you are not a big fan of the Chevron Doctrine and these related doctrines where courts defer to the agencies. How could the administration, how could your office bring about change in that area? So, um, so one of the things that we do think about, and I did, did mention briefly in my talk, is you know, thinking about how the agencies exercise their authority. So, so one of the things I think that's not emphasized enough is that administrative agencies have no inherent power. Right? So they can't just issue a regulation because they think it's a good idea. They have to point to something in a statute right, that gives them the authority to do that. They don't have any power to issue regulations unless they can look back to a statute. And, and so it's very important for us to make sure that agencies are staying within whatever authority Congress gave them. Now, you know, part of the problem is, is that Congress often gives agencies authority in some very sweeping terms, right? The, the example people often like to, to mention is, you know, statute giving, you know, the FCC the authority to, to regulate in the public interest, right? Well, that's not really much of a standard. It could be almost anything. And um, so, so that does pose a challenge. But I think one of the, the things that we can do, um, at least maybe in a modest way, is to encourage agencies not to rely on the deference doctrines. You know, instead to, at the outset, focus on the, the best reading of a statute. You know, not kind of pushing the boundaries of what the statute might allow, but, but really taking, looking at the statute as a whole and only exercising policy making within whatever it is that the, this text and structure best allows. Um, and I think that that's consistent with our obligation to make sure that we are faithfully executing the laws. Um, and I think it hopefully then requires us to rely on deference less. Oh, I hope we someday call something the Rao Doctrine. Yeah. That will be the reverse Chevron reverse Doctrine Chevron for the doctrine? agencies. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. I titled it. I, you, I branded it? it first. Okay, got I it. I branded it first. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So that's a very interesting point that uh, actually I don't think people have discussed is the agencies themselves reversing Chevron just in their own internal interpretations. Uh, that would, I mean, that would be a fundamental shift in the way... Uh, the regulatory state does business. What about working with Congress? Uh, do you foresee the administration working with Congress to also try to alter things like Chevron, alter some of these deference doctrines? Yeah. So, um, so there are lots of regulatory reform proposals floating around Congress, and there have been for many years. And and my office is, you know, working closely with the committees on the Hill that that deal with these issues on what might be a, a reasonable or possible regulatory reform package to move forward. And, and I, I think it's a great idea for Congress to, to potentially do something in this area. One of the things I think is interesting is that Congress is very much focused, um, the, most of the regulatory reform proposals are procedural. And you know, they, they relate to having more procedures or more OIRA involvement or something like that. You know, and I think those things can help. Um, but I do think that one of the, the most significant regulatory reforms Congress could undertake is to narrow the authority they've given away to agencies, right? To just pull back the authority they've given. And they're not, frankly, proposals to do this in Congress, but that would be the most significant and fundamental change, right? Because we're doing a lot. We're doing what we can in the executive branch, but that won't stop a future administration 
from taking an open-ended statute and running with it to impose regulatory costs. So, and I guess I would also say that I think Congress, the other thing I sometimes incur, you know, think about with Congress is, you think, why does Congress not regulate the environment itself? And you know, there are all these reasons given, well, it's too complicated, you need expertise, it's really hard, uh, we don't have that, so we, we let the agency decide these questions. You know, that argument is not the same for deregulation. You know, Congress could actually be a very efficient deregulator, not just through the Congressional Review Act, but through overturning bad regulations. So it's going to take us several years to do these environmental, you know, repeals of bad rules from the Obama era, because we have to follow the Administrative Procedure Act. We have to provide reasons. We have to develop a record. We have to do it the right way. And that's, you know, Congress could just eliminate it, you know, through simple legislation. And, you know, they don't need a lot of expertise to do that. They don't have to develop an extensive record. It's very efficient. Um, but we also don't see too much of that. Yeah. But I think those would be great projects for Congress. Okay, good. I, I want to give the uh, folks in the audience the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, and I, I hope you have a lot of them. Um, when you ask a question, just uh, let us know your name, where you're from. Uh, and if you don't have any questions, you know Naomi is a professor of constitutional law. I'll just call So she's you. just going to call cold on people and ask you questions. So it's much better if you I believe firmly in the hers. Socratic method. So, <laughs> so uh, please go ahead. You have some over here. Hi, I'm Julie Bala. I work at the George Washington University Regulatory Studies Center. And Does I GW has one too? I thought there was only the one at George Mason. We have a little uh, a side a side project going. Uh, so I was just wondering about with the increased potential workload that OIRA has, is there any push to expand the number of employees or the funding given to OIRA for future years to come? Yeah, um, I'm always happy when people ask me that question because yes, I would welcome more uh, more funding for OIRA and and I do think there's an interest in Congress to to provide OIRA with more funding. We are in the process of hiring, especially in the tax area, you know, pursuant to that new agreement. So, um, so we do hope that OIRA will be given some more resources. I mean, it's a pretty small office. We don't need that many resources to have quite a substantial expansion. So, and I guess now I sound like a bureaucrat. I'm just trying to expand my domain. <laughs> but uh, I'm Laura Cermak. I'm at Christendom College. Um, does OIRA have the bandwidth to suggest specific regulations to remove as part of the uh, one in, two out policy? <clears throat> you mentioned that you'd had great success and last year we were able to do 22 out. Did you suggest specific ones? Yes, um, we do actually. You know, I have a really great team of career professionals. You know, you're not going to hear me talking about the deep state or any of that. Um, the OIRA desk officers are pretty fantastic. and. And so they have lots of deregulatory ideas because they worked on bad rule in the last administration that they kind of had to swallow hard and let go. And so they have all kinds of ideas. And um, we do suggest them to the agency. And, and we do, frankly, more than that. We have, um, we have a process that occurs twice a year called the Unified Agenda, where the agencies list all of their regulatory and deregulatory actions. And that gives us an opportunity to say, hey, you know, we're not going to approve your agenda unless you include this item or at least one of these three items. You know, you need to take on some more deregulatory actions. And, um, you know, we don't get everything on the agenda that we want, but we get a lot of things. And agencies, I think, have, um, have been pretty good about incorporating our ideas. And so we're working on a lot of initiatives. For instance, um, the Department of Interior and the Department of Commerce have been working on like a suite of Endangered Species Act reforms, right, which is sort of comprehensive and across agencies. We've worked closely with them on that. We're working with the Department of Energy on energy efficiency standards. Um, we're proposing a lot of deregulatory actions around maritime, you know, in the open seas. So, so I think there's a lot of scope for that. Yeah. Gentleman right up here. Oh, hold on. Why don't you use the mic so they can record it? <laughs> Thank you. I'm Dan Berensky, retired lawyer and a big fan of the George Mason and a big fan of the George Mason uh, Institute. Uh, when I read about cost-benefit analysis, it seems to me that it's hard to quantify these things. So I was wondering if you could tell us how you actually quantify things that are very difficult to, uh, uh, to quantify and how that process goes. <clears throat> 
How about like uh, the cost of carbon, for example? Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it, you know, it is hard sometimes to quantify. I think um, it's difficult. You know, so OMB has, and this is very wonky, it has a circular that's been in place for a number of years, circular A4, which kind of sets out a methodology for calculating costs and benefits that the agencies use. Um, you know, in different methodologies you can, can do for that. I think... Um, you know, I think agencies rely on inputs from the public. So, right, oftentimes between a proposed and final rule stage, we'll get more information about the potential costs and benefits of a rule. Um, but it's difficult, you know. And you know, with even the best cost-benefit analysis, is an, is sort of a guess about what will happen if the regulation goes into effect. Which is why I think it's so important to have retrospective review, right? To look back and see if regulations are actually working. Which is something that the Obama administration also strongly supported, although I think it. It did retrospective review only sporadically. Um, and the two for one, I think, really puts a spotlight on that. Because if agencies have to get rid of something, they have to go back and figure out which regulations aren't working. And, and I think that's where it becomes really important. Because when, the more regulations you kind of study, the, you probably understand more about which cost-benefit analyses were flawed at the outset. And so it is a struggle. But I do think it's important, right? It's important to try to quantify the costs and benefits, even recognizing that sometimes it's hard to do that. And all the way in the back. Thank you. I'm uh, Bill Veal. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. And after that, I ran for 15 years a, a American business association dealing with a former Soviet uh, republic. And so this is a kind of harking to the uh, kind of prototype of the administrative state, if you will. Um, and it, it, I think of Philip Hamburger's work in this area. But I, I wanted to ask about what I think is a very important part of our process in this country, and that is the public comment on regulations. And if you look what's been happening recently in this area where we've been uh, press investigations and so forth, and finding that there's been a lot of, of fake comment uh, that's uh, basically uh, fuzzing this process and uh, 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 kind of uh, clouding the authenticity of, of that part of the process. Is your agency involved in, um, in trying to correct that or uh, oversight of that public comment phase or anything of that sort that could uh, begin to correct the situation? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think um, it's a great point because the public comment period is extremely important, right? It's sort of in some ways the foundation of some of the legitimacy of what agencies are doing, right? To, you know, agencies aren't very representative. At least the comment period allows the public to weigh in. And, um, you know, the reporting that occurred maybe six or seven months ago about these fake comments was extremely alarming to us. And so we do play an active role in kind of overseeing the e-rulemaking website. Um, and we have been, over the last few months, working closely with the Department of Justice and other agencies to figure out a way to kind of crack down on the fake comment issue. And so we are actively engaged in that. There are some trade-offs because, you know, if you impose too many identity barriers, right, then it will limit full participation of the public. So I think we're trying to find the right balance for making the comment process easily accessible to members of the public, you know, especially smaller entities that may not be sophisticated, while also making sure that we have, you know, we don't have this problem of fake comments. So they're working, where we are working on it and are concerned about the problem as well. End up right over there. Hi, thanks to uh, AEI for hosting this. Uh, my name is Michael Emancipator. I'm with the Independent Community Bankers of America. Uh, circling back to the independent agencies, BCFP in particular, you'd mentioned there's few levers that OIRA can really utilize in terms of checking their power. And I, I'm curious what could, if you could go back to maybe some of those levers that are available to you. You mentioned PRA or Paperwork Reduction Act as being one of them. Uh, also, Sabrifa, I believe, uh, OIRA has a role to play as oh, along with SBA advocacy. If you could speak a little bit more towards those levers, what you've been able to do, and if there's any anticipation in terms of increasing your role in the Sabrifa process. Sure, yeah. So the Sabrifa process is a process that only applies to a few agencies, but including the the CFP, I can never say the BCFP, right? Um, it doesn't roll off my tongue quite as easily yet. But, but yeah, so there's that process which sort of makes agencies focus on the impacts to small businesses, right? So we're involved with that. 
Um, we have an arrangement with the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, that if they have a paperwork collection as part of a rule, the rule can't take effect until we've approved the paperwork collection. So for instance, the net neutrality rule didn't take effect until after OIRA had reviewed the forms. Um, probably to all of you, the forms sound like a very strange and wonky thing, but um, the government imposes, oh, I don't know how much, you know, enormous costs on the public through forms and paperwork burdens. So, so a very big tool of deregulation is getting a handle on what kind of information agencies are asking from the public. So that's something we can do. Um, and I do think that the Congressional Review Act can be used more robustly with the independent agencies, which do send um, their rules to OIRA for a major determination. But, um, but I think that process can be used more robustly. And we're looking into ways to do that. And I have to say, there have been a number of independent agencies that have indicated a real interest in these issues, right? So again, at the FCC, Ajit Pai is in the process of creating this Office of Economic Analysis, right, which will work on reviewing the costs and benefits of FCC rules. And so I think that, you know, there's interest amongst the independent agencies in doing better analysis. And that's something we're happy to work with them on um, to further before, you know, as we're thinking through the, the more formal mechanisms. So all the way in the back there. You with the intriguing hair. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Douglas <laughs> Phillips. I'm a um, recent graduate of um, American University Law School. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the influence of NGOs, which uh, in the last administration, especially in the environmental field, were extremely influential. I was um, wondering if you thought that that influence was inappropriate and if there was some way to limit it institutionally in the long term. Um. You know, I mean, we continue, you know, at our office when a rule is under review, we meet with groups who are interested in the rule and we have meetings. And so we continue to take meetings from whichever groups are interested in weighing in. Um, you know, I think NGOs, like other groups, like businesses and individuals, have a right to, to speak to the government about their perspectives and weigh in and um, suggest regulatory policy that they might be interested in. So um, I think really the question is, what does the administration do with that information, right? Are they, are they balancing inputs from one group with inputs from another group? Are they looking at the full range of costs and benefits? I think those are really the, the important questions. But I think all groups um, should be free to come in and you know, talk to the government about their various perspectives. But I do think it's part of our role then to kind of, for agencies to filter those comments and um, make sure that they're being, I guess, robust in their analysis. Right in front there, in front of him. Adam Gustafson, I'm a lawyer in private practice. Um, you mentioned the Congressional Review Act, and that was in the news again recently because uh, BCFP bulletin was CRA'd. And I, I'd like to know if that means that this administration will be sending guidance documents to Congress I know you talked about trying to limit the use of guidance documents, but those that do come out, will they be sent to Congress um, on the assumption that those are regulations, rules? Yes, yeah, so, um, so the Congressional Review Act, is, as you know, right, uses the, um, a very broad definition of rule from the Administrative Procedures Act, which, um, which includes guidance documents arguably, right? And um, so rule is not just a notice and comment regulation, but it's also guidance documents. And so I think it is, it is um, you know, it's probably good practice for agencies to be sending their guidance documents for a major determination and then to Congress um, as appropriate. And so, and I think many agencies are kind of in thinking about how this should best be done. And we haven't set any kind of general policy on this, but, um, but you know the CRA is pretty clear about what constitutes a rule. Notice, by the way, while the mic gets there, Naomi is unusual for a government official. You've noticed she's not said the phrase no comment this entire period. So thank you for being so open and indiscreet. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Am I being indiscreet? Uh-oh. I, I've noticed, though, that I say things and nobody seems to notice because I just say them candidly and they're like, oh, okay, I guess that must be fine. 
<laughs> so I just go forth and say things. Um, it's Good. fine. Good. Hi there, my name is Quill Robinson, recent graduate from University of Washington, Seattle. Um, I think for many Americans, they see the benefit in deregulation, whether it's small business owners or farmers or, or whoever else. But for many other Americans, when they hear that, you know, elements of Dodd-Frank are being repealed or environmental regulations being rolled back, that's, you know, that sets off alarm bells. And I know this is not explicitly your role, but how do you think that we can frame deregulation in more of a positive light and communicate that to, to voters and people outside the AEI circle? <laughs> that's a great question. It is something I think about, right? Because part of it is... Um, you know, part of what any of us do who are presidential appointees, right, is have to convey this message, right, like why it's beneficial. And um, so what I try to focus on to people who are more skeptical of deregulation is to explain a couple things. Like one, at OIRA, we're only getting rid of regulations that aren't working, right? So if we have a deregulatory action, the benefits of deregulation have to be more than the costs, right? So like it's really by definition that the things we're doing are yielding Benefits. So if a regulation is working, we're not, well, there are plenty of regulations that aren't working, right? So we don't have to go after the regulations that are working. And um, so we're very mindful of that. And we're also, I mean, Congress has required a lot of these regulations, right? So we're not rolling back regulations that are required by statute, for instance, right? And, and I think it's important to stress also to, to skeptics that there are a lot of bad regulations, right? Regulations that are duplicative, regulations that are simply ineffective, regulations that really yield no benefits um, to the American people. And, and I think that is a bipartisan issue. I mean, I think everyone can agree that we have lots of bad regulations. We may disagree on which ones aren't working, um, but there are a lot of regulations that aren't working. So I think it's important to stress that we're trying to get government out of the way where it's being ineffective. And there are many areas where that's the case. And you know, and you can cite two examples that aren't you know controversial, right? The environmental ones always you know raise you know people have very strong interest in that. But you know, some of these are just common sense maneuvers, you know, common sense rolling back of, of requirements that I don't know. I, I can't imagine who would be opposed to them, frankly. So. Right up here. Hi, my name is William Frankel. I'm from Claremont McKenna College. Thanks for speaking with us. Uh, a lot of economists have suggested that the increasing consolidation of firms in the American economy is a drag, that it reduces the uh, incentive to innovate. It also increases prices through greater market power for each firm. And one possible solution to that is uh, the executive using antitrust law to try to take some action to break up big firms. The Trump administration unsuccessfully tried this recently. And there's been some suggestion that uh, Silicon Valley technology companies could be the next target for that kind of action. President Trump, for example, has talked about his frustrations with Amazon. Uh, other people have pointed to Facebook, social media providers, as potential targets. To your knowledge, is there a plan in works for the administration to target tech companies or anyone else in light of the recent AT&T uh, antitrust defeat to go forward with this similar kind of action? Um, you know, I don't work on the antitrust policy, you know, specifically, so I, I don't know that I have any, any, you know, insight into, you know, what we plan to do going forward. But I do think um, that the larger problem you, you raise about companies consolidating power is, is one that relates to the way we think about regulation. Because I think if you, you look at a lot of regulations, they create barriers to entry, right, for new, you know, for new businesses, for smaller businesses, and many of these regulations including the Obama administration's net neutrality rule, right, was really something that favored big business, right, compared to, you know, smaller providers of these services. And um, so that, I guess, is something we are mindful of as we think about deregulating, right? Where is the regulation just a barrier to entry? And I think it often helps these, these larger companies, which may be less innovative than smaller ones. So I do think, um, I think Lloyd Blankfein, you know, had said that, you know, he loves regulation, right? Because it just creates a big moat around his business. You know, I mean, I think that's a pretty common, a common view of large companies. You know, they, all they want is certainty. They don't care what the regulation is. They can throw lawyers and lobbyists at whatever it is that the government imposes on them. But the rest of us are the ones that are affected, right, with fewer choices and higher costs. 
and less opportunities to start a new business. And so I guess, you know, maybe that's sort of a, maybe that's a kind of a tangent in part to your question, but I do think it's, it's related. Um, so I, I know there's a lot of questions yeah. to come, but we've actually reached the end of okay. the time. So maybe you could stick around a little bit sure. after and say hello. But uh, join me in uh, thanking Naomi for a wonderful session and such candid remarks. Thank you, John. Thank you so much.